Hello besties and welcome to another Genshin Theory, but first I have some important stuff to talk about. You can stay up to this time here if you just want to get to the theory. First thing is, I just got over having COVID for the first time since any of this has happened, so forgive me if I sound a little bit weird because I still have kind of a weird voice, so that might still be a problem. <laughs> and now the real problem. Last week my channel got its first strike. You get a strike when you break YouTube's rules, basically. If you get three strikes, your channel is permanently terminated, meaning that all of your videos and subscribers are completely completely erased. I only got one and the penalty for that was that I wasn't allowed to upload for a week, that's why I missed last week. You're probably wondering what I could have possibly done to break YouTube's rules because surely they wouldn't strike someone for no reason. Well apparently I broke YouTube's rule about child safety because I had a vine of a kid falling in a harmless way in a video I made years ago. That has literally nothing to do with child safety. And even if it did, the kid didn't get hurt and I had nothing to do with that particular clip. I just used it in a video, I didn't produce or record it. And yet YouTube has decided that I should be penalized for harming children when I've done nothing of the sort. YouTube's rules have only gotten worse and worse over time. Ever since the implementation of the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, or COPPA, YouTube has done a horrible job of regulating content containing and directed towards minors. I fully understand where this law is coming from. Media is a slippery slope when it comes to children and they deserve as much protection as they can possibly get. However, YouTube's focus with COPPA is not in actually protecting children, but arbitrarily striking and banning innocent creators, intentionally or not. I am not the first or the last victim of YouTube's ignorant and harmful striking system. It's not even fully regulated by humans, meaning that sometimes underdeveloped artificial intelligence will make a mistake. I assumed that was the case in my strike, so I appealed it in hopes that a human would review it, but the review came back minutes later after another bot looked at it. The appeal was, of course, denied. This system is beyond broken as thousands if not millions of creators are suffering here. For a lot of us, YouTube is our primary source of income and we cannot afford arbitrary unfair rules and AI that gets everything wrong. To many of you who view YouTube casually, this may sound like an overreaction, but this is literally my and thousands of other people's livelihood and it's constantly threatened by stupid things beyond our control. We're penalized for harmless things under the guise of protection when it's really just performative to make corporate YouTube look like they're doing the right thing. They're not. In response to this instability, I've been working on setting up a Patreon. It's not finished yet, but as soon as it is, I'll let you guys know. Patreon is a much more reliable platform, so in the future, if this happens again, I'll have something to fall back on. And with that, I'll let you guys get to the real video now. To be honest, I found Sumeru's story to be somewhat underwhelming so far, especially with lore. Long gone are the days of exploring Enkonomiya, where we got a book that told us the entire history of pre-Archon War to that. I miss that kind of stuff. Sumeru just feels very detached from everything else. I know that isn't the case, but I don't know how to explain it. I'm just not having as much fun with its lore as I normally would. That being said, there's a few things in Sumeru that really stand out. The Ruined Golems and Zandik's Notes. Unless you have eidetic memory of the entirety of Sumeru's map, you probably don't remember who Zandik is right away. He's a character whose notes we find throughout Sumeru, chronicling his research of Conrean robotics and the withering. This immediately jumped out at me. Anyone who has any kind of relationship with Conria is worth keeping an eye on. Through his notes, you learn the story of Zandik's research team and how everything went wrong for him. I'll read some of the excerpts to you. Collected a lot of components, these spare parts of the huge machine, if only I could figure out its working principle and manufacturing process. Fiddling with these components almost caused a delay in my work. I am going to take them apart and record the size and shape one by one. But first of all, this secret must not be revealed to the other team members. Explore the jungle with Zandik. Zandik was attracted by the ancient machines left behind by some civilization here. He's young, handsome too, but he's too rigid. As a result, we have nothing to talk about even though we're exploring this place together. That terrifying killing machine has stopped. Zandik insisted on bringing it back to the academia to be disassembled and reverse engineered. That was absolutely ridiculous. Sage Sharnarma reprimanded him and removed him from the author list. We buried Dastor Sora and sent the wounded back. Looks like this field of research has come to an end. The deceased, Dastor Sora, multiple trauma wounds, lacerations, contusions on internal organs, hemorrhage. But the fatal injury is the wound on the throat, fractured hyoid bone. Mechanical asphyxia, unable to ascertain the cause of death. That's a lot to unpack. Starting from the beginning, the first note we read is written by Zandik himself. He's talking about taking apart a machine, almost definitely a Conrian Ruin automaton, but he has to keep it a secret from the rest of his research team. This research team includes someone named Sora, whose name comes next. They describe Zandik as imposing and odd, but friendly. They actually end up having a picnic later together, completely unrelated to work. But then in the note from the Sumeru investigation team, we learn that Sora has died from one of those ruined machines that Zandik was messing with. Luckily, he stopped it before anyone else died, but the damage was already done. The sage overseeing this research called off the entire thing and sent everyone back home, including Zandik, who was responsible for Sora's death. 
Whether the academia knows that or not is unclear. In the autopsy report, we see exactly what happened to Sora. At first glance, without piecing everything together, I've seen some people say that Zandik killed Sora on purpose. But looking at this, that must have been extremely difficult for him to do. I watch a lot of true crime documentaries, and one thing I've learned is that it's very strenuous to kill a person. It takes a lot of physical energy from the murderer to actually end someone's life, especially in the way described in Sora's autopsy. Sora's fatal injury was a fractured hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is in between the mandible and the larynx, so basically right beneath your jaw. Because of the bone's placement in the body, fracturing it is extremely rare. It's covered up by so many other things that getting hit in the neck or the face usually doesn't matter because it's covered up by other bones or muscles. Plus, to really expose the bone, you have to be looking up. Hyoid bone fractures only make up 0.002% of all fractures in humans, so in other words, it almost never happens. I bring this up to highlight how strange Sora's death is. A hyoid bone fracture in itself won't kill you, but the complications it causes will. Because of where the bone is located, fracturing it usually causes suffocation. Most hyoid bone fractures are seen in strangulation victims. Sora's autopsy is incomplete. There are ellipses all over the place implying that things have been torn or burnt off of the paper. If they were redacted, we would see the big block covering up text that we usually do. Following ellipses after mentioning the fractured hyoid bone, it says mechanical asphyxia. Mechanical is capitalized, implying that this is the beginning of a new sentence because it's not a proper noun. Mechanical asphyxia occurs when an outside physical force or abnormality abstracts the flow of oxygen. After some more ellipses, all lowercase this time, it says unable to ascertain the cause of death. These two phrases are likely part of the same sentence. So, from this autopsy, we know that Sora had to have been killed by some incredible force. Thanks to where these notes are located and the fact that they bring up a killing machine, it's implied that Sora was killed when Zandik reactivated a dead ruin machine, most likely part of the giant ruin golem we see in Devantok. A mountain. As soon as someone got hurt, Zandik turned the machine off, so I doubt that he wanted to kill Sora on purpose. He was friendly with them prior to the incident and turned everything off, jeopardizing his research when he saw that something had gone wrong. At this point, I don't think Zandik had murderous intent. But after that, things changed. Zandik's research of Conrian Robotics was completely cancelled and all team members were sent back to the academia despite his protests. He tried to tell the sages that he could bring one of the machines back and reverse engineer it, likely to be safer when turned on again, but his request was denied and he was laughed out of the academia. Zendik's story is quite similar to Il Dottore's. Dottore is one of the Fatui Harbingers, famous for creating delusions and reactivating that old ruin guard factory in Liga. In the comic, we see his fascination with biology and robotics, so much that he combines the two fields when transforming Krep into a robot. We know that Dottore was in the Sumeru Academia a while ago, but was kicked out because of his unethical ideas. After that, the first Fatui Fatui Harbinger Piero told him that he could research whatever he wanted in the Fatui. Because of their parallels, most people think that Zandik and Dottore are the same person. But Zandik and Dottore have totally different personalities. Dottore is the main antagonist of the comic. He performed human experiments on Kale when she was just a child and blackmailed the entire country of Mondstadt into dealing with the Fatui. Some people believe that he gave Krapus, Deluxe's now deceased father, the delusion that killed him and that he lured Ursa the Drake to Deluxe's caravan. Long story short, he's not a good guy. However, Zandik is not malicious at all. He was friends with his research team and only killed Sora on accident. That's a huge jump from normal guy to cartoon supervillain. I think that in the time between Zandik and the notes and Dottore in the comic, the guilt of accidentally killing his friend drove him insane. Zandik didn't tell his research team that he was tampering with the Conrian robots. He really couldn't have any idea what he was getting into, but he knew on some level that it was a bad idea. Why else would he keep it a secret? In keeping that from everyone, he endangered his team because they had no clue what was going on. That's probably why Zandik was able to shut down the robot so quickly after Sora was hit. He knew what he had done, so he just went and undid it. But he never told the academia the true details of the situation because because he knew it would get him kicked out. Researching science is Zandik slash Dottore's passion in life, so losing that would be absolutely crushing for him. He tried to reason with the sages, begging them to let him continue his research in a much safer way, but they thought that was a ridiculous thing to even ask. He was laughed at and kicked out of the academia, which made him lose his purpose in life. Only when Piero approached him with an offer to join the Fatui was that purpose reimagined in a much more sinister light. I don't think Dottore was always a bad guy. I think he just lost his mind over the guilt of accidentally ruining two lives. Sora and his own. He not only killed a friend, but sabotaged his own academic career. We don't know how long ago this was, but we do know that Dottore has a lot of clones of himself thanks to leaks in the final dialogue in A Winter Night's Lazo. The Dottore we see in that video was implied to be the real Dottore. Columbina tells this version of him that he looks young today, but Dottore takes offense to that probably because he just isn't young anymore. I must say, you're looking very young today, Doctor. You know very well that I do not take that as a compliment. So, where's the segment in the prime of his life, then? 
Zandique, the young Dottori, was around a long time ago, and the Dottori we see in A Winter Night's Lazo is the current, older version of him. There's still one thing left to address, though. At the end of A Winter Night's Lazo, we see Dottori burning down the Erminsel tree that we interacted with at the very beginning of the Sumeru Archon quests. <laughs> He's busy with a little experiment in blasphemy. <gasps> Colin, time to head out on patrol. Okay, Master Tainari! Erminsel trees hold memories of the world, and the Academia uses them for a lot of different things. I initially thought that Dottori was just burning this tree down on the Cerise's orders, but now I think this is his own personal mission. I think he wants to burn down this Erminsel tree so the world forgets what he did in the past. Maybe if everyone forgets what he did to Sora, they'll let him return to the Academia as if nothing ever happened. The only records we have of Sora's death in Zandik's research are torn up, burnt, and redacted. Somebody has already been making an effort to erase this event from history, but it isn't enough. To truly reset his life, Dottori must burn down the tree that holds the memories of his youth. I know that sounds like the end of this theory, but I'm nowhere near done yet. We still haven't even gotten to what Zandik was researching yet. Did you really think I would just leave you without talking about that? In Zandik's research, he mentions a Conrian group called the Schwanenritter. This was a group of knights working for the Eclipse Dynasty before the Cataclysm. The Schwanenritter was responsible for piloting the ruined golems. One of them is in Devantaka Mountain, and the other is somewhere in the desert. The one in the desert malfunctioned due to a design flaw. The knights didn't have the proper materials to repair it, so they salvaged whatever parts they could and focused on the other ruined golem. At some point while operating the machine, Hildrick suffered multiple organ failure for no reason and Inghildr went missing in a fight. This left only two knights, Hedura and Anfortis. For unknown reasons, Hedura betrayed the Schwan and Ritter and sabotaged a machine, likely part of the ruined golem they were inside of. She was executed by Anfortis, but still given a proper funeral. Anfortis continued alone until he eventually died as well. Later, Inghildr returned as a corrupted shadowy husk. The story is similar similar to what Zandik experienced while researching Conry and robotics. Somebody tampered with the robot, someone died because of it, and over time, someone once good became corrupted and returned to the scene of the crime. This is yet another instance of history repeating itself into that. We see this kind of thing all the time. The Sun Children in Rue, Guizhong and Orobashi, and possibly Lisa soon, the Moon Sisters and the Yakshas, and so many other things. I've already done plenty of videos talking about that, so I'll make this explanation short. Repeated history in the case of people has to do with their constellations. For example, Lisa is a Tempest Fugit, Latin for time flies. Her story revolves around her biding her time until she inevitably dies because she received knowledge that she wasn't supposed to. This is reminiscent of Guizhang, the smartest person alive during the Archon War who inexplicably died early in the war, and Orobashi who read before Sun and Moon and sacrificed himself before Celestia got the chance to kill him because he knew it was coming anyway. I think that these three characters share the same constellation of Tempest Fugit. But not every repeated event can be traced back to specific people. Sometimes the number of people doesn't line up for it to be anything about constellations. There were three moon sisters and five yakshas, but in both cases they lost their minds and killed each other and left something behind in the cataclysm. For them, I don't think it's about constellations, I think it's about ley lines and erminsul. The roots of erminsul trees are likely what ley lines are, and in that case that explains why there are so many trees in specific places where significant dead people lived. The erminsul remembers them and after their passing commemorates them. But like we talked about before, erminsul's memory can be a bad thing. For Zandik, Erminsel remembers his shortcomings and guilt. That's why he wants that tree gone. But in burning down that tree, he's not only doing himself a favor, but others in the future as well. Zandik was unfortunately doomed to his fate because of where he was. He was in the same place that tragedy occurred, and because Erminsel remembered what happened, it triggered a similar event to happen again. Erminsel's memories of the Schwan and Ritter mess with Zandik's fate, and that's why they're so similar. I don't know if Dottori knows this or not, but if he does, then that's all the more reason to burn that tree down. It's retribution for Erminsel ruining his life. It's an attempt to take back control of his fate. This theory is one of my favorites I've done in a while, but that's probably just because it has to do with me being a huge Dottori fan and being excited that I get to talk about him for an entire video. I just think he's such a well-written character, and I always have a lot of fun when I get to work with his lore. I want to know everyone's thoughts on Sumeru so far. We've had a bit of time to adjust to getting a new region, so I don't think we're all just going to say we love it because it's new anymore. I'm honestly not the biggest fan because I think the whole region is pretty incoherent so far, but hopefully the desert will be better. Thank you so much for liking, commenting, and subscribing, and I'll see you next time. Bye, besties! Peace.